In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, um, uh, guys, if, if something's different, it's just different, all right, uh, as far as what I wrote down and gave you for slides. But I, I want to preach this message. Here, here's what I believe the Lord was, was kind of speaking to me. Uh, it's these three words. It's not over. It's not over. And uh, I don't know who you are today, but I feel like you walked in feeling like it's over. It's the end. There's nothing left. But I'm here to remind you today that it's just the beginning. And in Acts 4, even earlier, we're going to look at two guys, Peter and John. And here's what I think happens sometimes is we see two guys in the Bible like Peter and John, and we go, whoa, it's Peter and John. They actually walked with Jesus. They were apostles. They're like superheroes of the faith. They're not like us. But here's what I think we often forget is that when Jesus died on the cross, Peter was stuck denying Jesus three times. I don't know about you, but that's a lot like me. John and the rest of the disciples were running and hiding, and they were nowhere to be found proclaiming the name of Jesus. They were scared. They were fearful. They were running away, and they're nowhere to be found. And in the back of their minds, even if they heard Jesus say, hey, I'm going to rise from the dead, there's probably a lot inside of them that thought this, it's over. This is the end. All that time we spent with Jesus, man, now it's just meaningless. Now it's just a waste. Now it's over. (laughs) Because we watched Jesus die. And nobody, we can't blame them, nobody had seen someone actually get up from the dead. But then all of a sudden, Jesus appears to them. And and then he begins to tell Thomas and the others, hey, touch the nail marks in my hands. But still, what what is the, the change from being fearful and afraid and nowhere to be found to now proclaiming Jesus boldly, which we're going to see in Acts 4. And Acts 2, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, they were bold in the faith and proclaiming the name of Jesus and 3,000 people are saved. In Acts 3, all of a sudden the power of God moves through them and someone is healed and that's why they're in trouble in Acts 4 that we'll read here in just a moment. But what is the big difference? One thing, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, Jesus said, hey, You wait, because I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And all of a sudden, what what took everything from being over to not over was the power of the Holy Spirit falling on these guys. And all of a sudden today, we're going to look at what the power of the Holy Spirit does. And I don't know what your background is today and how you walked in here. We've got people from all kinds of backgrounds. Some people love the Holy Spirit. Some people are a little bit afraid of the Holy Spirit. Some people don't even know what to think about the Holy Spirit. I don't even know where I'm at sometimes. I just want God, give me more of your spirit. (laughs) God, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. God, would I experience the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, would your Holy Spirit be all over our church and all over our services and in everything that we do. (laughs) Because if that is what we're seeing through the book of Acts to be the distinguishing factor was your spirit, (laughs) then God, we need some of that. (laughs) And what you're going to find today, I think, is this. That may be the thing that you need more of in your life so that you stop thinking it's the end and instead realize it's the beginning is a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I even pray all the time, Jesus baptized me in your Holy Spirit. I know that freaks people out, but God cover me in your Holy Spirit. (laughs) If it's your Spirit, I can't have enough of it, God. (laughs) And in Acts 4, if you would, um, stand with me all over the room in honor of God's word. We've got some scripture to read, and uh, it's about 20 verses. And 
whenever I have about more than 10, I make sure everybody stands up so nobody falls asleep, all right? Um, I remember as a kid coming to church and leaving sometimes and thinking, man, that was a lot. That was a lot of reading. <laughs> and now I'm just like, I was complaining about us reading the Word of God, right? <laughs> so if you leave and just complain because we read a, the Word of God, we did a pretty good job. Acts 4, verse 13, look at somebody and say, I'm ready. Look at somebody else and say, you better get ready. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Pause for a moment. I'm going to pause a few times. <laughs> when God moves, and it's so evident that God moves, even if there is opposition, sometimes they have nothing to say. Because they know God is moving. They know God is working. They just don't like it. But they can realize, we don't know what to do. <laughs> After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that, that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in his name again. Pause again. Whenever a move of God starts to take place, whenever the power of God starts to take place, there's always another power trying to stop it. There's always another power trying to oppose it. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Woo, I love verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. <laughs> Anybody unable to stop speaking about what you've seen and heard God do in your life this morning? All two of you? <laughs> Let me ask you again. Anybody unable to stop speaking about how you've seen God move in your life and work in your life? Anybody this morning? See, I ask that sometimes because if we're unable to do it in here, how are we going to be able to do it outside of here? And the truth is all of us have seen God move and seen God work in our life, and we ought to shout for joy <laughs> at what we've seen God do. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything to the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the, the, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot Feudal things, the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Look at somebody and say, don't miss verse 31. Woo, this verse, I could preach for days on this one. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. God, shake us today. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. God, fill us today with your Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word of God boldly. God, allow us to speak your word 
boldly. You can be seated. I, I, I want to look at what the power of the Holy Spirit does, and i got to do it quickly. But number one, here's what I would say. It gives you boldness. The power of the Holy Spirit gives you boldness. Look at verse 13. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John, it was noticeable to them that these guys have a boldness inside of them. Now, I reminded you earlier, but it wasn't that long ago that Peter was denying Jesus and none of the disciples were proclaiming Jesus. They were hiding and they were in fear. But now they have a boldness inside of them to take a stand for Jesus, to step up for Jesus, and to stand out for Jesus because now all of a sudden they've got a spirit in them that is greater than any spirit around them that is greater than any opposition around them, that is greater than anything surrounding them. I'm here to remind you today that if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you've got a spirit inside of you that is greater than anything else around you, that you have something in you that you may not even realize is there. I'm here to remind you today and encourage you in this. There is more inside of you than you could ever think or imagine. You say, Sam, how could I ever stand for God? How could I actually be bold for God? I, I don't know if I could ever do that. <laughs> Through the power of his Holy Spirit, you can. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, you can be bold for Jesus. And friends, oh, man, we live in a world today where we need some believers of Jesus Christ with a backbone. That doesn't mean that you're going to be a jerk to people. That doesn't mean you're going to be rude to people. That means you're going to love people where they are, no matter their background, no matter their lifestyle, no matter what they're going through. But you will not compromise the truth of God's words. You will not back down when it comes to the truth of God's words. You will not run in fear when it comes to the truth of God's word. We need more than ever for believers of Jesus Christ to stand up and stand out and say, I'm not backing down. I'm not backing away. I'm not running away because I know there's a God that lives. I know there's a spirit within me. I know that there's a greater life and a greater truth and something greater in store for you. So I'm going to put a stake in the ground, not standing on my own might, or my own strength, but standing on the word of God and letting him be the solid rock on which I stand and all other ground is sinking sands. And I'm not going to waver and I'm not going to back down, but I'm going to stand up for God. I'm going to be willing to look crazy for God. I'm going to be willing to take insults because I'm standing for God. Isn't it interesting how the enemy loves to just whisper in our ears and remind us of things from our past or remind us of things from yesterday that make us fearful to stand for God? Happened to me in the last 24 hours. I feel like the enemy was just whispering in my ear, don't say this, don't say that, don't preach boldly, don't do that, don't do this. Don't you remember what you've done? Don't you remember where you've been? Don't you know that some people actually know who you are? And, and I know that you're in the room and you probably have the same thing happen at times. And so instead of standing bold, you back away in fear. I, I'm here to tell you this morning, don't let something from yesterday keep you from what God wants for you today. Don't let something from your past keep you from what God has in store for your future. Don't let something that he's bringing up Keep you from all that God has for your life. And let me remind you, even though there's that voice, there's another voice. Woo, I'm going to take off running, Bruce, here in just a moment. There's another voice that's stronger. There's another voice that's louder. And it's the voice of God. And he's saying, hey, I don't care where you've been. I've got you now. Hey, I don't care if you don't know all the answers. I'll give you the words to say. Hey, you just proclaim my name. And it's easy to be fearful. You know, we just had Valentine's Day. This could be dangerous asking this. 
Ladies, let me know with your shouts of applause and amens. If your man brought you roses or took you on a date this past week, can I hear you this morning? All right. If he didn't, will you raise your hand? I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, my goodness. We saw a hand. <laughs> Terry, we're going to need a marriage conference in 2025. <laughs> Anybody been on a bad date before? Anybody been the reason it was a bad date before? <laughs> I remember one time, and I, I like to consider myself usually pretty smooth, Larry. Um, but, but one time I went on a date with a girl in college, and her name was Ann Lauren. And, and I'm telling you, I don't know what happened. From the moment I picked her up to the moment I dropped her off, it was, Daryl, it was a disaster, all right? I would, have, I would have not gone back on a date with myself. I would have been mad at her if she wanted to go on another date. It was one of those where I picked her up and, and I couldn't even find the words to say. I was just stumbling through my words and just, just couldn't even talk. And then I go to pull in at the restaurant and, and I hit the curb as I'm pulling into the restaurant. And then I'm going to eat my meal and I'm dropping food all over my shirt. And, and, and here's what began to happen to me. And I don't know if you've ever been there. The more I messed up, the more fearful I became. And the more I began to back away and try to just get to the point where I dropped her off and ran away from ever, forever, right? I'm not so sure that there's some of us today that because there's been moments in your life where you haven't spoke up or you haven't taken a stand or because there are some moments in your life that don't look so pretty or there's some baggage, that you've just become more fearful and fearful and fearful over time. And I just want to remind you this morning, it doesn't matter what's behind you. It only matters that you submit to God today and follow him with all that you are. You don't have to be fearful. You can stand in faith boldly. But number two, look at this. I love this. I love this part. It overrides any training or education. The power of the Holy Spirit does. Look at what it says. And realize that they were uneducated and untrained men. And who were they? Fishermen. I love the Bible. It includes rednecks. and says rednecks can be used by God. Have you ever thought about that? All you large bass fishermen that think, I don't have to talk about God. I can just go to my boat and look at the Bible. Peter and John were fishermen. They were untrained, they were uneducated, and, and, and I bet there was people that were thinking, man, these guys should be out on the water. They should have never threw their nets to the side. But now here they are, and they're amazed at them because they're saying, we don't even know how they're articulating this. We don't know how Peter is talking like this. They're uneducated, and they're untrained. <laughs> but the power of the Holy Spirit trumps that every time. I'm not saying don't grow. I'm not saying don't get in the word. We'll look at that. I'm not saying don't have training and education. But I am saying don't let that be something that disqualifies you from what God is calling you to do. Just this last week, um, we baptized a young man named Dakota. And if you were here this last week, I, I told you the story about how Pastor Chris prayed with him. He received Christ. He explained to me he's a new creation and that now he's free. And that Dakota looked back at Pastor Chris and said, I feel it. <laughs> And last week he got in the water. This is him right here. But here, <laughs> woo, I may run today, Bill. I may run. Here's what I love about this story. The guy gets out of the water. 60 minutes later, his hair, look at his hair. I wish I had beautiful locks like that, you know. He's still drying off. And after the service, Pastor Chris sees him praying with someone. And he asks him, hey, what's going on? He said, I'm praying and helping my friend accept Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on. How great is that? Yesterday, he's texting Pastor Chris and said, hey, can you give me details about Connection Church in Columbia? Chris says, sure, but, but what do you need them for? He said, I've been witnessing to someone who's 65 years old, and I know it's too far to come to our church, so I'm trying to plug them in at Connection Church in Columbia, Tennessee. Can we praise God for that? 
Listen to me. You say, Sam, why are you sharing that? This guy's been out of the water six days. And he's probably the best evangelist, and I'm in this, in our church right now. He doesn't have the training. He doesn't have the education. He just knows that Jesus has changed my life, and I can't help but tell somebody about Jesus. Sometimes the farther we get away from that moment where God changed everything, sometimes the drier we get from that moment we were wet in the waters of baptism, sometimes the farther away we get, the more it is just old news to us instead of good news to us. And shame on us, myself included. I'm not beating you up. I'm in the same boat. I'm just saying, God, don't let me ever forget how you changed my life. And God, don't let me ever stop telling people about you, about you. Number three, look at this. How do we have the power of the Holy Spirit? It comes from being with Jesus. It comes from being with Jesus. Meeting with God, reading the words of God, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We believe it's one God that exists in three persons. And in Acts 1, Jesus is the one that said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And they received it from Jesus. I, I want to challenge you today to think about this. Being comes before doing. You've got to be with Jesus before you can do for Jesus. I I'm not saying he can't work through you for a season or for a time, but there will be a moment where it catches up to you. Here's why. Because you will begin to pour out and pour out and pour out and pour out, and you'll wake up one day and say, I've got nothing left, because you did not keep filling yourself. You, you did not keep getting a fresh filling yourself. That's why on the planes, and I know none of y'all pay attention during the instructions. I don't pay attention during the instructions. Half time, y'all don't even pay attention during the announcements here. I know you, right? And so you're definitely not listening on the airplane. I'm not. But I've been on one enough that when they drop the mask, what do they say? Put it on yourself first. And then you can put it on somebody else. Why? Because if you don't, you'll run out of oxygen first. And you won't be able to help anybody. In the same way, if you don't get a fresh feeling yourself, if you're not with God, if you don't spend time in this word, spend time praying, you won't have anything left to give to someone else. Say, so Sam, I, I don't know how, I don't know where to start, and I just want to encourage you, man, man, start in one of the Gospels and just begin to read a chapter a day and just spend a little time, and then I would encourage you, just begin to journal, begin to pray to yourself, listen to some worship music. If you don't know how, man, call the office. We'll help you in it. We want you to be able to get in God's Word and pray to God yourself and worship to God yourself and not just rely on someone else to feed you, but rather, as well, you can feed yourself. But number four, here's what also happens. It allows you to keep going. It allows you to keep going. Look at what Peter and John say. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. I'm going to move quickly here, but there's going to be hard moments in life. There's going to be moments where you're faced with opposition. There's going to be threats that come your way. There's going to be times where you want to give up and not live for God and throw it all away and throw in the towel. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that allows you to get up the next day, to still speak that word of God boldly, to keep going, to keep telling, to keep preaching, and to keep living what God has placed inside of you. And then number five, think of this. The power of the Holy Spirit is what leads to the shaking and the filling and the working. Look again at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. There's a church called Brooklyn Tabernacle. The pastor's name is Jim Cimbala, and he wrote a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. A great book if you've never read it. And he describes going to pastor a church. Problem was, the church he went to pastor was dying. 
and it was dying in a lot of ways. No one was coming. No one was attending. He said even one Sunday he was sitting in a pew, and while he was sitting in the pew before he went up to preach, the pew just broke and hit the ground. Could you imagine? <laughs> Nobody was coming. He, I think at one point he describes that the offering per week needed to be about two fifty, and they were only bringing in about $72. And he hit a moment where he was like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know where you want us to go. I don't know how you want to work. <laughs> And even one Sunday, he got up to preach, and he got so emotional with everything going on, he just stopped in the middle of the message, and he went down to his seat, and he began to weep. And when he did that, people just began to pray out loud in the service. He went away just right after that on a trip to Florida. And he was on a boat, and he was praying, and he was asking God what to do, and he was asking God what, what should I do? Where should I go? God, without you, we can't do anything. God, I don't understand. I feel like you've called me here. I feel like you've placed me at this church. And the book goes on to talk about how he says in that moment, he just began to feel like God was speaking to him, and he heard the voice of God speak to him. He said he felt the word of God just say something like this to him. If you will lead my people to pray, you'll never lack something fresh to preach. You'll never lack an offering. You'll never lack when it comes to attendance. In fact, you won't be able to contain the crowds that I will send your way. As I read that this week, I just wrote below it, it's the praying that leads to the shaking and the feeling and the working. Look at it again, verse 31. When they had prayed. God, here in just a moment, would you shake us, would you fill us, and would you work? Jesus, it's not about my words, it's all about you. I could preach the best message I've ever preached and nothing can happen. I could preach the worst message I've ever preached, but if your Holy Spirit is here, all kinds of things can happen. Holy Spirit, shake us. After they had prayed, the place was shaken. And they began to speak the word of God boldly. Friends, there's power in calling upon God. Because it's only God who can do what we're asking. This morning I sat in my office and I looked through all the prayer cards that people laid at the altar last week about miracles. And I'm telling you, there was countless things that you could think of. Someone saying, I've got suicidal thoughts and I want them to be gone. Someone saying, I want my family to be restored. Someone praying for someone that was another family. Someone wanting to be set free from addiction. Here's what I think when I read those. Only God can do it. And we've got to call upon God. He's the only one that can save your life. He's the only one that can change your life. He's the only one that can redeem your life. He's the only one that can sustain you and restore you and come with you through life. It's only God. And how do we get to him? Through prayer. Through prayer. It's calling and crying out to God. And why? Why do I want God to shake us? <laughs> Boy, that doesn't sound too good sometimes. I don't always like the shaking, if I'm honest, and I'm a pastor. Because <laughs> I want God to make me feel uncomfortable. Because if I'm not uncomfortable, I'm never exercising faith. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if I've got to be shaken so that I can be filled by God, then God, shake me all you want. <laughs> Here's what this looks like. God, <laughs> I know I'm a pastor. But God, even I sometimes don't want to give to a missions offering. But God, shake me of my desires and remind me of what's at stake and how important it is and where this money will go and the impact we will have with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I don't always want to take this stand on this issue. But God, shake me. Because if I want to be your mouthpiece, I will have to say some things that make people feel uncomfortable at times. God, I don't feel like doing it anymore. 
But God, I need a fresh touch and a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit so that I can walk out in the power of your strength and not my strength and we can see you glorified. And then I need the filling of God. I want to be filled so up that it overflows. And then I want God to work through me. I want God to work through me. It's not over. Somebody walked in here today and you feel like it's over. You feel like, man, I felt like I had a moment where I encountered God, but I don't know where God's been the last 10, 15, 20 years. It's not over. If he started something in you, he'll still work it unto completion. Some of you are so beat up and so broken down, you don't know how to get through tomorrow. It's not over. Listen to me. These guys thought it was over. The beauty of the power of the Holy Spirit is Jesus said, I'm leaving. But I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending you the power of my Holy Spirit. And it will reside in you. Some of you, you need that power today. Now the power doesn't come so we can just get a good feel. It comes so that we can go to work for the glory of God. You say, Sam, why, why are we going to take up this offering? Why do we want to be shaken and filled? And why do we want God to work through us? Let me just give you some real quick examples of what this offering is going to. Look at this first picture of Mark Montgomery real quickly. Guys, throw it up there. Mark Montgomery is right here in Williamson County doing FCA at the schools. He gave us a testimony that he saw someone he coached in middle school receive Christ this year as a high schooler and that they've seen tons of students come to know Christ in huddles on public school campuses. That's what that's going to. God, work through us. Work through us. Look at this next picture real quickly. This is Daniel and Lacey. They serve at Rescue One. They fight sex trafficking all over. Listen to this. In the last year, they've seen 203 survivors here locally and across the country, find freedom, hope, and Christ-centered opportunities to recover and heal. That's what that's going to. God worked through us. You saw it earlier, but look at this picture of Brent Jones and the Nicaragua team. I'll tell it quickly, but they went and they talked with the mayor. The mayor was excited. A church was coming to that city, but there was no electricity in that city. So they set it up where there could be electricity in that city. The mayor, listen to this, the mayor was so impressed in Nicaragua that she gave her life to Christ and now is attending that same church. Praise God for that. And then let me end with this. It's not the mission's offering, but why do we want God to shake us, fill us, and work through us? Just last week, guys, throw this picture up. Not the next one real quick. This picture on the left is a young lady named Kelsey. Kelsey is the sister-in-law of Kevin who's in our tech booth back there. Can you all give it up for Kevin and our tech team back there? And you can go ahead and stand all over this room. I'm about to close with a little ministry time. But Kelsey was here last week. And last week when the invitation was given, she just felt like she needed to give her heart to Christ and give her life to Christ. So she came during the invitation and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. I love that. The guy that's in our tech booth every single week got to see his sister-in-law accept Jesus on a Sunday morning. God, if you gotta shake us, and then fill us so that you can work through us so that we can see another Kelsey, another Dakota come to know, know you. God, do it. Do it, God. That's what it's all about. We're going to end the same way we've been ending. Maybe today you just need to pray. The altar's open. And you can pray and say, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you fill me afresh? Maybe today you're like Kelsey. And you can't have the Holy Spirit. Because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And today's your day. There's no better day to accept Jesus than today. And then maybe today you just need to sing. Well, sing and declare with all that you are. I call this pray, bring, and sing. Whatever God lays on your heart. But I want to challenge you. We're about to be out of here. But we'll probably do some ministry time on the end of every service. Why? 
Because after the word, we just want to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Don't try to get to the next thing. Don't get caught in a regular routine of the Bible belt. You respond how God calls you to respond. So he's saying, what does that look like? Right now, some of you feel God beating on your heart that you need to come pray. That you need to ask God for a fresh filling, a fresh touch, that you need to surrender something. Others of you, you're, you're ready to run out of this room because you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Listen, we're on your team. There would be no greater joy than us helping you talk through how to accept Jesus. And then others of you, you just need to sing for a moment and reflect on what God might be saying to you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Prayer partners are going to come. They're going to leave room for the altar, though. Holy Spirit, as we sing, would you minister to us? Take away any fear. God, if we need to move, would we move? If we need to come, would we come? God, if we need to respond, God, would we respond? Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You move as God calls you.